It's Rich Best with Live Nation Los Angeles, and I'm on Promoter 101. Hey, kids. It's that special time of the week. Who wants to go over to Uncle Stani's Playhouse? Welcome, kids. It's always a good time to see you again, and we've got a very special Stani's Playhouse this week. Let's just jump right into it. What do we got, Mr. W? We're going to spend this week nerding out with some of my favorite people in the world from Minneapolis. First Avenue's Nate Krantz is going to be on this podcast talking about all sorts of growth, acquisitions, all the deals they've been cutting in Minneapolis and the Twin Cities. We're also going to talk international touring with A.J. Paul from APA. And we're going to round out this podcast with a war story from UTA's Jeremy Holgerson. And news of the week with Works Entertainment, W. Luke Pierce. Hey, this is Mike McGinley. Mitch Rose. Peter Katz is Mike Hayes. Tony from APA. Vince Bannon. Sean Healy. Steve Rennie and Rick Canning. Sam Kenkin. And Rob McDermott. Happy to be here on Promoter 101. Promoter 101. Promoter 101. Promoter 101. Fucking Philly. Start the countdown. We are coming in two weeks. That's right. Dan and I are going to be in the city of brotherly love. Come catch us Wednesday, January 30th at the University of the Arts at the Kaplan Recital Hall. We're going to have a very, very special guest on that episode, a live taping with Live Nation's Jeff Gordon. So admission is super reasonable. That's right. It's just free. Get there early so you make sure you grab a seat because it's not that big of a venue. We want to thank our friends over at the University of the Arts for sponsoring us. Doors will open at 630. The show is at 7. I got to tell you, if you're going to talk about someone who has done it all in this business, Jeff Gordon is the perfect person to focus on. I mean, you talk about the fact that he just opened the mat. You think about the announcement yesterday that they've got the first boxing match returning there since it's come back. But it used to be this legendary place to see fights Philly. So, I mean, just think about Rocky. It's like, holy shit, how cool is that? He's bringing fucking boxing, not just rock and roll to the Met in Philly. How cool, Luke. Dan, I can see it right now. You and Jeff Gordon running up the steps like Rocky in front of the art museum. It's going to be a, a wild night in Philly. January 30th, be there. Hope to see you at live taping of Promoter 101. Antics should prevail afterwards. Just hoping. Dan, you can listen to this podcast pretty much anywhere at this point. Yep, buddy. The rumors are true. You can find us on Spotify and iTunes, iHeart, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Stitcher, YouTube, and Google Music. That's right. Google Music. That's the place to hear us because... Um, Let's be honest, it's all about Spotify, iTunes, and Spreaker, and SoundCloud, but yeah, Google Music. It's like a thing for no one. Anyway, we're at all those places, Luke. That we are, and so is the conversation, Dan. If you're on social media, come join us. We're talking about all the time on Twitter, Instagram, Instagram Stories. Dan is at The Jew. The show is at Promoters 101. That's Promoters, plural, and I'm at W. Luke Pierce. Come check us out. You are at W. Luke Pierce, and... If you've got something to share with us, you can always email steiny at promoter101.net. Tell us what you're thinking. Tell us who you think we should have on the podcast. Do what you want. It's important. Whatever. Hey, and then call your mother. Call your mother. This is Marsha Vlasic, president of AGI Talent Agency on Promoter 101. Have you missed any of the past Promoter 101 episodes? Well, hey, we can help. We have now set up a website that is determined to be there for your needs to find any of the past Promoter 101 episodes and hear them in real time at your beck and call. That's right. Any of the industry special guests that we have had here talking about whatever you want to know are available like the encyclopedia of rock and roll that it has become, Luke. You can find that at promoter101.net. This week, we're featuring episode 72. Dan, it was quite the doozy. If you haven't listened to it, go take a trip back down memory lane. We were joined in that episode with Paradigm Sam Hunt talking about working in the business for Tom Windish and the sale of Windish to Paradigm and his current success, still working with Diplo and Run the Jewels. Later on that podcast, we had Jim Cressman, one of Canada's last independent concert promoters left in the game. A phenomenal talent buyer with a lot of great stories. And we rounded out the podcast with Ticketmaster's David Marcus. 
walking us through what was then the new Verified Fam. Great insight into a product that has now become commonplace in everyday's lives. You can hear about the origin of all that and so much more. Episode 72 of Promoter 101. Kind of the hat trick for the year. I mean, talk about it. Marcus Cressman and Sam Hunt. It's easy to tell why that was the second most listened to episode of 2018. Murderer's row of content right there, Dan, and a lot of great conversations. Highly suggest you check it out. And when Luke suggests something, people listen. Jim Glancy Barry presents on Promoter 101. News of the week. Brothers and sisters of the entertainment industry, it's time for us all to gather as a congregation, put our hands up, and listen for the news of the week delivered to you by brother Luke Pierce. Can I get an amen? Amen! Thank you, Dan, for that wonderful introduction. It is indeed time for news of the week. We're going to start this week's news with a pair of announcements about some upcoming public performances. The National Recording of the Arts and Sciences announced that 15-time Grammy winner Alicia Keys will host the 61st Annual Grammy Awards this February 10th at the Staples Center in Los Angeles, California. Gladys Knight will kick off the Super Bowl with the Star Spangled Banner, hoping to, in her words, unite and represent our country in her hometown of Atlanta. The seven-time Grammy winner will perform at the Super Bowl, whose halftime show is going to include Maroon 5, joined by Big Boy, an Atlanta-based rapper from Outkast, and Travis Scott on February 3rd. The Financial Times reported last week that Liberty Media is in talks to acquire a state and creative artist agency, expanding their potential reach into the music industry that has been on quite a tear as of late. CA, which of course is home to major recording artists and performers like Lady Gaga, Ariana Grande, Bob Dylan, and so many more. Their current shareholders include private equity shop TPG and Singapore-based Temasek. Financial Times reported that Liberty is likely to acquire a substantial stake in CAA. And Liberty, as of late, through SiriusXM, which it wholly owns, agreed to a $3.5 billion acquisition of Pandora, which is set to close the end of March, while Liberty itself has been linked to a possible buyer in the stake of the now $33 billion valued Universal Music Group. Spotify making some waves in India this week as they enter into a global content deal with T-Series, India's largest homegrown record company. With more than 160,000 songs in its catalog, T-Series includes some of the most popular Indian music recorded from the past 30 years, and all of it was made available to Spotify users on January 14th when the deal was announced. According to Music Business News, T-Series is the biggest record label in terms of local market share in India, giving Spotify a much-needed foothold in a longly contested marketplace. Stay tuned for more information, and that'll do for News of the Week. Hi, this is Jason Kupperman from Paradigm, and you're listening to Promoter 101. It's everyone's favorite time, the announcement of the Promoter 101 Badass of the Week. This week, our badass comes to us from Philadelphia Live Nation. Mr. John Hampton, one of the best talent buyers in the world and a hell of a guy. You just got to imagine he is one of those guys that not only can do karaoke, but fucking kick your ass on the ice on a hockey game. Got to love John Hampton, Promoter 101's Badass of the Week. Well done, John. Looking forward to seeing you in Philly in a couple weeks. Hey, Jim Cressman, Invictus Entertainment Group, and you're listening to Steiny on Promoter 101. In our featured interview on this, this episode 118 of Promoter 101, I'm going to sit down with one of the great independent promoters who's consolidating a lot of business in the Twin Cities area. We're joined now on Promoter 101 with First Avenue's Nate Krantz. Coming to you from beautiful downtown Aspen, I'm joined by Nate Krantz from the lovely First Avenue in beautiful Minneapolis, Minnesota. Welcome to the podcast, Nate. I'm happy to be here. We've known each other a long time. We've partnered shows together. We've been resources for each other for information and generally friends. I look at you as a peer and someone that just really knows music. You understand the deal. You understand the acts. And you're a huge, huge music fan, first and foremost. Absolutely. I mean, that's how I got into this was, you know, I love seeing concerts. I still do love seeing concerts. And I love that I get to work in this area of the business. You come from humble beginnings from record store days. Yep. When I was in high school and thereafter, I mean, I did try college for a minute. It didn't take. But yeah, that's what I did. I, you know, I worked at record stores. I still collect records. And through my employment at record stores, I started to meet people that worked at First Avenue. And after a few years of retail, I had the opportunity to go over to First Avenue and still kind of work with the record stores. I started at First Ave 
doing promotions and really being the liaison between the club and the 15 to 20 different record stores that we had as partners back then that did the vast majority of our ticketing. So it was never really the goal for you to be a concert promoter. You just kind of fell into it, record store, into promotions, into booking. Yeah, absolutely. It was a great opportunity when I was doing the box office and record store liaison job for First Ave because I got to work with the bookers. This was just after Rich Best had left First Avenue and went over to whatever Compass Entertainment, I guess, at the time. And so it was kind of a transitional period. And I got to be in the office and see what they were working on. And there was a kind of a gap in that there was a lot of music that I really liked that I knew was popular, at least at the record stores, from talking to the, you know, the guys every day. And nobody at First Ab was really chasing these shows down because they didn't really know what they were. And so I guess I just kind of fell into it and talked to Steve McClellan. And eventually it wasn't right away, but eventually he started letting me buy shows and I loved doing it. And so that became my focus. You guys have really ventured out. It was the two venues, right? Because First Avenue's always had the smaller club attached, 7th Street Entry, right? Yep. Which is what, 450? Nope. The entry is 250. Very punk rock, 250 room, legendary spot. And then, yeah, next door is First Avenue main room. That's uh, 1600. One of the greater ballrooms around the country. Yep. You guys opened the Turf Club. Is that the first edition? Yep. The first edition, as far as a venue, is the Turf Club. And that's what, 350? Is that right? Yep. That's a 350. And that was a real natural step for us because I had actually been doing concerts at the Turf going back to 1999. So we knew the room really well, and we were probably putting in just as rental clients, you know, 50, 60, 70 shows a year. And so when we had the opportunity to buy it from the former owner, it just made a ton of sense. We loved the room. We knew it was like the other real cool small room in town. And so it was just a fantastic opportunity and it's worked out great for us. Okay. So some booking synergies and it also give you the opportunity of going through a buy. Yes. So in a fairly small venue, but the same process for buying a company exists regardless of how big or small. It's just how much more accounting is involved. Absolutely. Every deal we've done since then has been very similar to how that one played out, including how we've went about financing the projects and taking over operations and figuring out the best way to do those transitions. Okay, so the Palace Theater came online. You guys did a giant remodel. Yep, we're partnered with Jam Productions on that one. And I think we worked on it with the city of St. Paul for about six years, whereas they're the actual owner of the building and we're on as managers and we have a you know management deal over there. But we also worked with them over the course of six years weekly to make sure that the building was designed and remodeled in the manner that we wanted it to be. So, you know, it was a fun, it was a collaborative project and it was obviously different because we were working with the city government and there was state financing involved and you know, it's a different process than like what you or I go through just as, you know, a day to day. You get that off the ground and incredibly successful launch over the first couple of years there. And now you guys have taken on some additional venues that you've announced just recently, right? So Fitzgerald's coming online as a new announcement that you guys just made very recently? Yes. It was funny, the timing. We've been doing working in the fine line a lot. I added it up. I think in the last 12 months, I had done 90 shows in the fine line, just renting it out. And so earlier this summer, the owners of the fine line just approached us. They had gotten rid of all their clubs and moved into the private event business. So the fine line was kind of an odd duck in their business. And they approached us and asked if we wanted to buy it. Once again, it was real natural fit for our business. It's right down the street from First Avenue. It's got a great capacity at 650. So it's a nice kind of transitional room from the smaller up into the First Avenue size gigs. And we were already staffing it. Like when, when I did shows where there, I was already providing the box office person, the, the front door person. I was using my production staff over there and we were the only people booking touring shows. So we took it on. We, you know, it was really easy to figure out a fair price and that was a real easy transition for that one. We were also, as you mentioned, taking over or buying the Fitzgerald Theater. And that was an opportunity that came to us about a year ago. Minnesota Public Radio reached out and asked if we'd be interested. And that is obviously, a, you know, it's a thousand cap fully seated theater. So it is kind of an anomaly with the rest of our venues. And, you know, it will be a little bit more of a challenge, but we're really excited about taking it on. It's beautiful, you know, historic hundred year old theater. We've had a lot of luck. We've just started announcing the shows that we've booked since we announced that we were buying the place, and there's a lot of excitement. So 
you do shows outside of your venues as well. You use Rick Hansen's rooms at the Trust, and the Orpheum, the Pantages, the State. You do the arena as well. You've gotten a chance to promote Adele. And then you go into some other markets with some of the bigger acts that you work with throughout the region. You'll go in Duluth a couple times a year with an atmosphere or trampled by turtles or what have you. Yep. You know, like what I call like our good buddies. So, you know, like the atmospheres or hippocampus or trampled by turtles. We'll take them and, you know, do a show in Rochester or do a show in Duluth or whatever it is. We have fun doing those. But yeah, like you said, we also go into most all of the other rooms in the Twin Cities and it's just more of finding what's the right fit for which artist at any given moment. So, you know, we got involved with Jack White or Beck at the Armory recently. We also do the outdoor series with Andy Sears and in Jam. We do the Surly Brewing Festival Field series every summer, which has been growing each year that we've done. And I think this will be our fourth year, probably be up to maybe eight to 10 shows. And you guys are also doing the outdoor shows at the Caboose, right? With Rose. Yep. And we also partner with Gene and Rand and do the outdoor series at the Caboose, which we've been doing for a really long time now. That's just incredible. Like the growth is insane. How many shows a year are you guys doing now? I think around 1,100. So it's a lot of click, copy, repeat because it's a very similar process on any show, right? You build the offer, you confirm it, you do the insurance or whatever. It's like, I'm sure you got yearly policies on your menus, but you lock in your production team, you lock in your marketing, you've set up ticketing, you do the catering, you deal with advance, you load in, you load out, you settle. It is an amazing amount of accounting. Yeah, it's a lot. We don't have a huge team, but... I do have really great people heading up each department and, you know, we've got a system. I mean, you know, like it is kind of rinse and repeat on this, but also every show is different and every show has different needs. And so we don't want to ignore the developing bands. And so that's, you know, always the challenge And that we're, as you mentioned, we, we are doing both sides of things. And sometimes, you know, it's maybe harder to cut the deal for the large show. But it's easier once you put the show on sale because the tickets just fly out the door. But it's equally important to us that we're taking care of the smaller bands and the developing bands. We also do a lot with local music, a lot more than I think. you got to fill your dark nights. Yeah, but we also have a great music scene. So it's not just filling dark nights. I mean, I just two weekends ago, I sold out two palaces with Hippocampus. We did 4800 paid over two nights. Next weekend, I'm going to have two sold out atmosphere shows. And so we're constantly developing through our smaller rooms the local scene as well, which is really important to us. 1,100 shows, that's a lot of cash flying through your venues. We pay bands a lot of money every year. I know the business says, do you? Not all shows make money. Yep. I know your batting percentage is high. Probably, what, 85% or greater of, of wins, right? Give or take. You know, I don't even look at it that way. I do pay attention to like what our percentage is of shows overall. All right, but not every show makes money, right? Absolutely. And some, maybe 3 or 4% lose significant money because you're just going to guess wrong sometimes. So it's not a given, although the business in general is successful. But that's a lot of volume in cash flow that's going to the artists. You have a huge overhead between staffing all of these venues. And now you're buying these venues, which requires a massive amount of capital, particularly when you're renovating places. It's all outlay. So you guys are putting out an amazing amount of finances. I imagine that's got to be a huge strain on the system with the amount of growth that you guys have had in such a short time. Actually, it's really not because we've been really careful about these moves that we've made. Every step has been very measured. We didn't just dive into all of this at once. And so... You know, like with the fine line, for instance, we were already doing that. So it really was not much of an outlay. So it wasn't an extra huge scaling of, of outlay for cash of whatever, because you're already doing it. Yeah. And so, and we've always, to their credit, Dana Frank, who owns First Avenue, and before her, her father, Byron Frank, has always been really good about making sure that when we're doing well, money stays in the company. They're not taking giant distributions and pulling the cash out of the company every year because I know Dana, much like myself, she wants to be able to do these things. She wants to be able to, you know, when there's an opportunity, be able to jump on it. And so we've always made sure we had cash reserves and we've had the ability so that when these things came up, we would be able to go nuts. Now you mentioned Dana, but you're also a partner now, right? I'm a partner, but Dana is the sole owner of the company. How does that work? For me, it works great. I mean, I love working for a small company. I know that if I want to do anything, she has my back 100% and she's one phone call away at any point in time. So we're able to do things quickly when these things come up. I mean, I can tell you literally with the fine line, the owner of the fine line called me. I called Dana. A week later, we probably had 98% of that deal 
done. That's a lot of due diligence very quickly. <laughs> so their books were very well organized. Yeah, it was real organized. Because that usually just, it comes down to numbers at that point. Yep. And really, it just came down to us negotiating the lease and figuring out what the transition would be between the old ownership and us. But a lot of it, we already knew what, how the shows were doing because we were doing all the shows. So I knew I knew every upcoming booking. I knew how every show there had performed. Really, what I was reviewing is the food and beverage side of things. So mergers and acquisition has become part of your job description now. Oh, absolutely. I mean, like obviously, I still buy shows, but it's half my job. Certainly venue management and also just looking for new business opportunities takes up at least half my time. M&A has been a big part of my last year. It was a new experience for me because I never had any idea what was involved. It's such a detailed, outlined system of what needs to happen. Everything has to be exact and it has to be clean. And if it isn't, there's a clawback to fix things. But things are very well spelled out. These are not one page contracts. And the due diligence that goes involved is huge. I mean, a term sheet is easy, but actually fulfilling a sale is pretty complicated. So to get to the point where you've got that streamlined is really impressive that you guys have done this a number of times now. I mean, when I say we have it streamlined, yeah, we know what to expect. But as you mentioned, you know, due diligence, it doesn't get any easier just because you've done it a lot of times because it's a lot of information to review and every person you're working with is going to be different. And so with the Fitzgerald purchase, that's real estate. So we're buying the real estate. So there's a lot more due diligence as far as actually checking the condition of the building. In all of this, it's on the historic registry. So we have to be cognizant of what we're allowed to do as far as changes, you know, and respect the building and respect the theater. And furthermore, we're buying it from Minnesota Public Radio, which is, you know, obviously a giant entity that just does things a little different than your average, you know, rock and roll bar owner. So that due diligence is going on right now. And it's just a different challenge. (laughs) We've gone through an amazing career path with you very quickly here. But let's go full circle. Did the kid that asked for an application at the record store all those years ago when you were in high school ever see yourself talking about mergers and acquisitions about music entities in such a depth thing and everything that could be your future? Hell no. Hell no. I mean, I, I just had no idea. I have learned on the job what this is. And thankfully, I've had a lot of like great mentors and great people that I've worked with. The music part, I've always understood. That's easy for me. I love music. It's my passion. But, you know, Byron Frank, he was a real businessman. And so like having him be the owner and take me under his wing for 10 years, I've learned a lot. And it's just one of those things. I personally couldn't have known this is what I was going to do. And I couldn't have known, like, go to college for it because it wasn't necessarily what I didn't know I wanted to do this, I guess. So I've been real lucky. And I mean, obviously, I grew up in Minneapolis, First Avenues. That's my home turf. And so when I got this job, I also knew that there's I can't fuck it up. You're booking an iconic room. Yes. You know, it's funny. The first time I visited you at the First Ave, I, I came in town, happened to be the week the Prince passed to see the people that were camping out around your venue. Because it was a shrine to Prince. It was the get-go. It was a given. Mm -hmm. Like the responsibility that your community has built around your venue. It's something you guys take real seriously. Oh, absolutely. We're so lucky. The bands love coming in and they love, you know, hearing the Prince stories and talking about Prince or whatever. But still, we try and be real nice to these fans because, I mean, to this day, I know like every day there's people that come from around the world and they're there to get their photo taken in front of the Prince star or come in and just pop their head in to see. The First Avenue legacy is always tied to Prince Purple Rain. So... It's not done by itself. Sonia does a, a tremendous amount of the booking. Yeah, and I don't know if you know this. We worked together before First Avenue even. So, you know, we're, we're best friends. And it's, I'm so lucky that we've worked together now for two decades at First Ave. And she definitely does the vast majority of the booking for our rooms. You've got an amazing staff from the production team to the box office. Your staff is well-trained and well-versed, and they know what they're doing. The system you guys built is amazing. I can go into that for a while, and I I wanted to give those people a shout-out because I thought it was important. Yeah, they're great. I couldn't agree more. We couldn't do this without an amazing staff. But you are a music guy, first and foremost, and it's one of my favorite things about you is there's always three or four bands you're really excited about that I don't know about yet. (laughs) I say this with the utmost respect. You are way more of a music nerd than I am. Well, thanks, Dan. Who are the three or four bands you're into right now that I'm not going to know about? Let's enlighten some listeners. Right now, I have been just obsessed with a lot of British jazz, just a great jazz scene coming out of London. But also there's a guy named Micaiah McRaven that's a drummer from Chicago. And he's amazing. He just had a kind of coming out show, I would call it, at La Poussin Rouge 
if I pronounce that right, New York last Sunday. And, you know, he collected people from London, Chicago. And what he does is he, he gets together different groups of musicians and they improvise. But then he takes the recordings of those and brings them back into his studio and kind of rearranges it and makes almost like mixtape style things. It's really exciting. Like Rolling Stone just did a feature. But they did a review of the show and they described it as bringing dance music back to jazz or making jazz music danceable again. It's in its club music. It's not stuffy jazz. On the British side of that, there's a guy named Shabaka Hutchings that has his hand in all sorts of different groups. My favorite record of the year is called Sons of Comet. They toured smaller rooms. I wasn't able to get them to Minneapolis. But now he has another group that is touring this spring called The Comet is Coming, which is real awesome. It's like a mix of electronic and jazz. And this is really what I've been listening to nonstop lately. Nate, thank you so much for taking time and talking to us. Thanks, Dan. The First Avenue team is just buying every venue and building in the land of the Thousand Lakes, greater metropolitan area, growing like mad, and we love them dearly. What a great team. Nate leading with Dana and Sonia. Just great people. Great business going on. Thank him so much for coming on the podcast. Hey, we're home free. And we're on Promoter 101. Tweet. Tweet. Tweets of the week. No, Dan, I heard there was a petition to rename this section of the podcast to Stani's Wisdom Hour, but for this week, we're just going to keep calling it Tweets of the Week. Start here, Dan. No one thinks their band sucks. But it's better that they don't learn that they do from you. Truth in that, Luke. How about that odd moment when you're offered a legendary act that no longer draws? But they still want real money every time. This one is pretty good, Dan. I understand it well. The great thing about promoting acapella groups is no backline gear. Ever. But sometimes they still show up with semi-trucks full of production. That'll do it for Promoter 101 Tweets of the Week. You can follow Dan on Twitter. He's at the Jew. I'm at the Jew. Call you a mama. Hey, everybody. It's Jesse Lundy from Point Entertainment here in Philadelphia, and I'm on Promoter 101. We we'll take a break in between two of our featured interview this week and hear a war story from UTA's Jeremy Holgerson. Jeremy Holgerson, we've got a war story. Yeah, so the Pogues first started touring, a lot of people were weary because all the Shane McGowan stories when Shane toured solo. And there was promoters that didn't want to book the Pogues at first, the first time we brought him over. Mark Schulman actually luckily believed in it, and we did four nights at the Best Buy. That sold out like right away and set a record until I think Phil Lesh played like six or seven nights later on. But, you know, the Shane McGowan stories precede anything Pogues related. And Pogues was always spot on, had great tour manager out there, great manager, had it down to a science so that it worked. Like we'd sit in a city for two or three days, take a day off, get to the next city so Shane could get there. It feels weird to talk Pogues with that pints. Yeah. <laughs> um, everything was amazing. The entire Pogue cycle. We had two problems. We had one where Shane tripped in Boston and blew his knee out. And we Big ended up for them too, right? That's got to be one yeah, of the biggest. Yeah, it was the, the last night in Boston. And, you know, that was the only problem. And he still played the rest of the tour in a wheelchair, which was amazing. Did he finish that show? It was the very end. It was okay. the very end. It was like a weird freak accident. Like the bass player, he's, you know, Shane's a creature of habit. If everything's where it is, he knows how to move around the stage. But the bass player, Daryl, had moved the stool that he okay. kept his cigarettes and his drinks and everything on, like a little to the left. And he turned around and since it wasn't where it was, he like fell off the stage and hurt his knee. But that wasn't the war story. The war story was we were playing Voodoo Festival. It was the last date of a run that started on the West Coast. Voodoo was on a Sunday. They had a day off on a Saturday in New Orleans. I remember I was like at the park with my daughter, like 12 o'clock or something. And I got a call from the promoter, like, is anything, everything all right? We don't, Shane's not here. And I'm like, no, no, everything's fine. I'm sure it's fine. I got a call from the tour manager shortly after, like, we can't find Shane. It turned out the last night of the tour, Shane had a friend with him on the road and, and it was like at the end of the tour, so people were going to sleep early. Everyone was just kind of tired. Shane's friend was like, hey, let's go out for a drink in the French Quarter. So they went out for a drink in the it's French New Quarter. Yeah, you it's, it's it New Orleans. Where you might want to, you know, have someone watching Shane just for whatever reason, his, he went out with his- What could go wrong? What could go wrong? So I guess like they were in the hotel lobby and tour manager was like, where's Shane? To his friend, he's like, oh, I left him in the bar. I went home early. I was really tired and I went home and he left him at the bar. And he's like, you know, when you're on the road as a touring band, you a lot of times don't know where you're staying. You need your key card. Like, you know, even if you're anyone in, in on the road. So he left him at the bar and Shane didn't know where you're staying. You know, you're on tour. You're being led around. You're going toward a tour. You're, you're, you're self-contained. You're the guy, you're the so all yeah. of a sudden he's in a bar on his own. I guess, you know, he didn't know where the what the hotel was, where they were staying, didn't have his key card or whatever. And it's New Orleans. The bars don't close. So everyone's looking for Shane. No one knows where he is. Show's about to start. I'm getting calls from the promoter, from Ray Hodge and, and Ashley at, at Voodoo. Like, you know, where's Shane? Like, and I'm tour manager's like, I'm, we're trying to find him. Don't worry. We're stalling, trying to 
figure this out. And then uh, they had to go on. I guess they started the show because, yeah, they had to. I mean, it was, you know, it's a festival and showtime. And Can you do a poke show without Shane McGowan? Well, I mean, Spider filled in, you know, when Shane wasn't in the group for a little while. So it started out. And then I guess he somehow, through the night, asked his way. He'd been up all night, I guess, asked his way around or figured out how to get to the Voodoo Festival or where the park was. Talked his way in the door. I guess, you know, second song in, Shane's kind of approaching the stage. Finishes the show. Wasn't the best show, as you can imagine, if he was up all night. Pulled it off. But it was, you know, a lot of phone calls, a lot of screaming, a lot of like, oh, no, don't worry. Shane's on his way. A lot of figuring it out, calling the tour manager. Where is he? Yeah, you know, still don't know where he is. Okay, okay. I'll call you back. I'm, I'm stalling on the line. And yeah. If you're the audience and you do the first song and a half without Shane and he comes out for the song three, you're just like, holy shit, Shane McGowan walking through the audience. And where the fuck is he? Like, yeah, how I mean, cool? He like, the like talked his way in through security. And you can imagine Shane trying to you know, talk his way to, if you don't know who Shane McGowan is, you're. Kind of like, who is this guy? Right. Will there be more Pogues tours? Are they going to continue to work? I don't know. You know, every couple of years we talk about like Ride Fest or doing one final show. The last tour they did, they called it the Parting Glass, which in Ireland is like the last call, but it's like not saying last call. It's like the Parting Glass is the last drink. It's kind of like saying see you later rather than goodbye. Yeah, I think they'd want to do like one final New York show. We've been trying to and, you know, hopefully we'll see. I don't know. It's we'll up to Shane. forward to that one. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Cool. Can you ask for more than a Pogue story running around New Orleans like that? Shane McGowan, Jeremy Holgerson just brings it with that war story. Nailbiter and it just true Pogue's punk rock form to show up mid show and fucking pull it off at the end of the day. But I think the lesson is you never leave Shane McGowan alone in New Orleans by himself drinking. Never. Jim Rungi, tour manager for Imagine Dragons, and we're on Promoter 101. And rounding out our featured interviews this week, we're joined next with international touring expert from the Agency for the Performing Arts, Mr. A.J. Paul. Hanging out with A.J. Paul in beautiful Beverly Hills, California. At the Montage. Dude. I get to hang out with you with some of the coolest places in the world, but now we're in your city. Last time I think it was London. Yeah, it was London. I think it was ILMC. Always a good time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you focus on the international business, but you do it from here from the States. So it's a little more challenging because you've got a massive time change that you have to deal with from L.A. Just shit, London's what, in eight, nine hours, depending on the time of year. Yeah, it's more challenging in regards to that. But, you know, a lot of the managers and artists that we work with are on this time zone. So I think it makes it easier for them. I didn't realize that. So it's only yeah. the clients that are, it's only the venues that are buying the shows with the talent buyers that for are, the most are, part yeah oh, okay so for them it's a lot more seamless instead of having to wait for like their agent in london to wake up or you know for them to get on the same time zone apa doesn't have a an office overseas if i remember we, we do have an office in london in soho is that a new thing no it's primarily focused on physical production so there's no music agents that are necessarily based there right now but when you're there you have a place to work correct Oh, okay. And we're over there frequently. Right, because you're constantly covering dates. Correct. So do you represent many international artists over there? Because it seems like that'd be hard to scout talent um, in a place where there's so many other agents. There, there are a few that we do. Uh, there's one band, Kensington, that's based in Holland, who's massive there, you know, really breaking out into other markets in Europe, which we don't represent them here, but we do represent them in the United States. You know, we're waiting for the timing to be right for them to come over here. And also we're focusing you know, a lot of our efforts on finding talent in like Southeast Asia, Korea and China, which is a new thing that we've been trying to get our hands on. Booking internationally from the States is a challenge because you don't bump into your buyers randomly. No. Passing no. in an airport or something. It's like a lot less interaction unless you physically no, get you on a plane just, and go you, to Germany or get, something. You get on the phone and then you get on the plane. I mean, that's for the most part, the only way to get it done. So there's a lot of times where I'll be working from like 11 p.m. till 7 a.m. And that's really the only way to make a relationship with them is to get on the phone or to get on a plane you're not the only agency that does this icm does work similar scott mantel books from la mm -hmm. here and they yeah. definitely do the same kind of thing so it's not unheard of but it certainly is got its own hurdles and challenges but you guys it, it, do a crushing amount of business overseas it, yeah no i mean it definitely has its hurdles and challenges as you said you know i spent a lot of time on the road so i spent two weeks probably a month either you know in europe or australia or asia or the middle east or wherever it might be because in order to do our job like we have to see the venues we have to get like a vibe for like exactly what's going on on the ground in each of these markets so no you can't do it just solely by like working from an office in la but like i said you know get on a plane and go see the markets you know get a feel for the culture get a feel for the people and that's the really the only way that you can do it and try to make partnerships with the right promoters in these countries that you trust you know and they trust you so you're really developing the artist in the right way 
This is a very cool thing. You take a client overseas, you introduce them to new revenue streams that maybe they're not seeing because with what Spotify and YouTube and the internet in general has opened the world to, or all these artists or all these other emerging markets that radio used to have to be serviced and get the ad back in the day. So yeah. maybe your act isn't being serviced in Holland to radio because the label doesn't have the budget for that. Right. So they never really developed there. But now... It could just break on Spotify and the algorithm could really be pushing that out to a lot of people. And yeah. suddenly you're huge in Holland. And the beauty of it is that with these different services, you can see the analytics and get the data. So you can really kind of see where your artist is getting traction. For the most part, I find that it's not like a specific country where an artist breaks, but more or less like a region or a group of countries. Like I have some artists that I work on that are right now like blowing up in Scandinavia and then I have other artists that are in the same genre that are like mostly like you know mainland Europe and the UK who's blowing up in Scandinavia lots of people name drop buddy name drop uh, like right now we have an artist by the name of Lil Mosey that I work on with Jordan Stone Little Mosey Lil Mosey hip hop it's good hip hop you guys represent 50 cent right yeah 50 is definitely like a legend so you work in a hallway with a lot of big personalities Oh, yeah. Andy Summers is down the hall from you. Mm -hmm. Craig Newman is there. Bruce Solar. Josh Humiston. Josh As you Humiston. just continue to go down the line, younger guys coming up like Aaron Dixon, mm -hmm. Max Gold. Like, there's some cool vibe. Jamie Kelso. Yeah. All running down the L of the music agents mm -hmm. that you happen to have your desk plopped right in the middle of it's yeah. like that's a lot of resources that you get to it's, tap into every it's, day it's fantastic and what i like about it is there's not like one cookie cutter agent or personality at our company so you can kind of pick up things that you like and pick up things that you don't like and you're not walking down five guys like wearing a sport coat and you know a button-down t-shirt and jeans like you get different personalities and different skill sets from each person yeah i believe you share a wall with guy richards i do okay he's a machine. so he's the best by the book and i've said this on the podcast before i think by the book he is the most technically proficient agent in 100 percent. just being able to overhear things just being that close and like the in passing the wisdom that you must pick up yeah no he's a machine he's he's got his methods down and nothing slows him down and He's probably one of the only agents that I'll see in on Sunday. You come in on Sunday. That's, yeah, sometimes. Is that because the time change and you're, you're... Yeah, or just if, like, say I'm working, like, an all-nighter from, like, Thursday into Friday morning, I might not come in on Friday because I was up the night before, and then I'll come in on Sunday to catch so up. So to find the buyers, you'll work different hours sometimes? Oh, absolutely. have to. Yeah, and then if I come in on Sunday, then I get Australia and Asia when it's their Monday. I imagine the minds that run that place, Bruce Solar in the music department now, yeah. and then Jim Gosnell, who oversees yeah. the entire agency, leave you to your own devices to figure out when you need to be in for, to accommodate for, for the, the time. For the most part, yeah. Because nine to five in California just isn't going to cut it to book those international tours. No, and then, look, I'm a big proponent of being in the office. Personally, I would like to be there you know, as much as possible, but it's just not necessarily sustainable to do it all the time. You know, I've been at the company 10 years, so they know that just because I'm not necessarily behind the desk, it doesn't mean I'm not behind my laptop on my couch. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Well, then they see what you're booking. Your yeah. numbers run through the office. It's not like they don't know you're doing your job. Exactly. So some of the international stuff is now booked from here, especially for Live Nation and AEG. They've got some of, I mean, a lot of that's done regionally, but like Jason Miller spends a good amount of his time booking from LA. Is that mm -hmm. something where you can drive down the street and catch up with Jason Miller and you guys can get into a bunch of shows? Yeah, I mean, we to be honest, we haven't done too much business together. I can't say personally speaking for him. But he can't be the only he can't be the only person based here, right? I know Chuggy comes to town all the time. Like yeah. there's a lot of that stuff that people no, deliver I, themselves to you, right? Because they want the business. There are outgoing people that will come visit. Absolutely. No, I mean, like I said, he's in the office like three or four times. But Southeast Asia, China, it's a different animal and there's very specific acts that will work there and that won't. I know Steve Strange works from here half the year too mm -hmm. in LA. So the yeah. idea that the managers are here and Coachella is here and it's just like, so he has a house here because he can get twice as much coverage between here and working from London. And yeah. he goes back, he takes advantage of both, but there's a ton of business that can yeah, be done there's, here. There's certain seasons, you know what I mean? Like right now between like right after summer through the end of the year, it's like all hands on deck to be booking festivals for next year. So like for me, this is probably one of the busiest times of the year. And so either I'll be working like 11 p.m. to 4 a.m. and then or I'll be over in Europe. You guys book Skillet for the world, right? Yes. 
So they just announced a big Russia tour, right? Yeah. So when you announce, I think Serge is doing that, right? So it's yeah, like, Serge is doing it. Yeah. Well, so when you announce, we just had a baby. Yeah, he's great. We love him. <laughs> That's the genius of IMC, by the way. If <laughs> you've never had the experience of meeting the guys that book all over the world, you get to hear different stories. And Sergey has to worry about the front line of war sometime affecting mm-hmm. whether a show could play or not. And some of these guys have different issues that they worry about that we never ever think about the dress codes in some country mm-hmm. are an absolute real thing especially when you're talking about young pop stars yeah. like and you're going to some of these really really constricted governments where they're like we want to see what she's gonna be wearing before we approve this yeah. the, the show license I, th- I think one time we had skill at doing two i think it was park life festivals one in moscow and one in ukraine and it was right after i think there was like the pseudo invasion into crimea from russia so like the one in kiev that festival obviously didn't do so well at the time and their currency like really collapsed. Like, right and you've got to worry about all that with the value of the dollar is everywhere because yeah. for some reason when you go to Canada, the bands get paid in U.S. funds anyway. I think Canadians have gotten used to that with U.S. artists, but mm-hmm. almost every hour else internationally, you deal with the local currency. For right? the most part, I mean, look, it, it is what it is. There's certain acts where it's you know beneficial just to have all of our deals in dollars, but still you have to be conscious of the ticket price. So even if an artist, you know, wants X guarantee, depending on what the valuation of the currency is, it dictates what the fan can pay. So, you know, if the dollar is extremely strong. Is that how you currency, choose markets sometimes where you're routing based on what the value of their dollar is? No, I mean, you know, ideally we choose markets on where we have the strongest demand for our fans. But like a lot of markets where there's a strong demand, you know, South and Latin America, their currency compared to the dollar is extremely weak and getting there between freight, flight, visas and all that stuff is you know expensive so although you might have a lot of fans in these certain countries on the artist side they just might not be able to actually do it because hmm. the, their costs are you know x and you know the ticket price doesn't equate to that so if a band is successful in america let's say josh humiston is booking the next hot rock band that's coming out not put a name to it for the moment right. but josh is really good at discovering new talent and building x and breaking x josh right. has had a very successful career over the last 30 years doing mm-hmm. that so he wants his manager wants to kick that up internationally and josh walks down the hallway and says to you this is an act that has done very well for us and they're interested in having an international presence now they've yep. noticed their numbers internationally have really kind of spiked where do you start i pick up the phone and i start calling my promoters in most countries i have like a handful of guys and women that i really trust and usually before it gets to that point i'm already kind of like teasing them with stuff that i think might have legs over there so i start with that and i have the conversation the only way to really kind of break a band is you got to have partners in these countries that are passionate and that can really move the needle whether it's on the label side they can call up the you know the label rep or you know, they can push radio or like get it on the festivals that are necessary. But festivals would be the first entry into a market for an artist that it's not necessarily proven in ticket sales. So when you're dealing with some of these other countries, you're obviously not going to go there and sue most of these people. So the contract and the deposit are a huge thing. And yeah, I get if they fuck your act, you will go sue them. But the deposit's really paramount, right? Yeah, I mean, look, it's paramount in anything. I mean, one of our main jobs is to make sure that the artist is, you know, financially taken care of. But like, right, but if I'm down the street and somehow we don't get a deposit in on one of our dates with APA, one of the 250 shows we do a year, nobody's sweating it. They know the band's going to get paid just based on the volume of relationships. But we have different we're down recor- the street. We have different recourses. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? And that's and that's kind of why I like the international aspect of it because it's still a little bit of the wild wild west you know what i mean it's not one-stop shopping you go to like one promoter and you know every deposits are going to be paid it's still a little bit of the old school mentality where you know you have to be really hands-on and you have to choose the right person and really like monitor to make sure that it's being done the right way and it's a little bit more difficult but that difference and that challenge is to me what makes it more exciting than just doing domestic touring so aj i know you as someone with a very big personality me no yeah we've known each other for a long time (laughs) and i enjoy you more than most not more than most people enjoy you i enjoy you more (laughs) than i enjoy most people i find you to be very personal but in the business of dealing with different international personalities different cultures have different acceptabilities of behavior yeah do you have to monitor who you are representing yourself as when you're on the phone whereas you can joke around pretty liberally with me and then some of these international buyers based on where they live some things are a little bit more constructive and yeah definitely yeah. i find that it's still the music business so people tend to be like a little bit more accepting of different personalities okay. across the line but 
Yeah. I imagine with Sergio, you guys probably fuck around just as much as you and me would. Yes. And I find that with not necessarily country by country, but more or less personality by personality or promoter by promoter. You know, obviously, like when you're dealing with something, promoters in China or Japan, Malaysia, Singapore, people tend to be a little bit more conservative or reserved. And if you're taking a band into China and you know that the government is so hands on and Mm -hmm. so very involved with everything. Are there certain artists that you think to yourself, this is a country you shouldn't be messing with because you are not yeah. as able to yeah, tailor I'll, your show I'll, around what's needed? Well, yeah. I mean, I'll get inquiries for like an artist like Lil Xan, for example, and I'll go great offers and we'll look at it and I'll say, hey, like, are you sure you're going to be able to get government, you know, approval? Are you sure you're going to be able to get the permits for something like this? And for the most part, they'll respond like, yeah, of course, you know, no problem. And in the back of my head, I'm thinking, okay, no, this is going to be something that might be an issue. More recently, and this is came out of left field, I had a show in London that was canceled because the police were going on to artists' Instagram accounts and looking for like, whether it was use of marijuana or like guns or certain stuff like that because there's been like a few different acts of violence whether it's fighting or stabbings at certain clubs in london so so the police aren't just randomly cracking the whip they're trying to avoid bad stuff happening yeah but it seems to be for lack of a better word it seems to be more like culturally profiled you know what i mean their heart's in the right place but they're doing it the wrong way yeah i mean they're they're specifically going after like rap shows or hip-hop shows so i know that's been a big problem and I think our show was one of the first international acts that was actually canceled. And for when you're sending an artist from, you know, the U.S. overseas and you only have a handful of dates that you're looking to do, taking one out of the equation is a massive problem. They canceled it like 24 hours before, you know, they threatened to withdraw the permit from the club. That'll really screw up your week, especially when you're counting on that money. Oh, yeah. Especially when the artist is already there. So before I let you go, do you have any advice for the young agents coming up behind you that are looking to get into the international game? Yeah, I mean, I would say use your assets and use the agents at your company that are already doing that. You know, always feel free to reach out to people like myself. We need more people that are doing it. There's not a lot of international agents, especially ones that are based here. And get your rest while you can, because you're not going to have it (laughs) once you start doing this. Are you hiring? Uh, We're always looking, 100%. There might be some additions soon, too. Little sneak preview there from APA. Yeah, I'll I'll come back on the next one, and hopefully we'll have some news for you shortly. Thank you so much, AJ, for making time. Thank you. AJ was so kind to give us of his time. So thankful for him, especially because we recorded in the United States during daylight hours. And since he's booking in the UK when it's basically he's basically a vampire living in the West Coast booking Europe. It's insane. Don't know how he does it. I'm guessing it has to do with coffee. I'm Jason Miller. I'm the president of Live Nation New York, live and direct on Promoter 101. Well, there's no better way, Dan, to wrap up a podcast or to name drop than announce the birthdays for this coming week, January 18th to the 24th, 2019. Friday, January 18th goes out to Portland, Oregon's own King of Christian Concerts, Lowell McGregor. On Saturday the 19th, we're wishing a happy birthday to Zach Winston, Baron Ruth. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. We'll sell you the whole seat, but you'll only need to have a birthday. Mark Bauer, Brian Aspald, and CAA's own, the legendary Robert Light. But you might know him as Rob Luke. On Monday the 21st, wishing a happy birthday to Tom Taylor. Tuesday, 122, Cena, Clover, and Aaron Palmer. On Wednesday the 23rd, wishing a happy birthday to Kathy Felling. Thursday the 24th, Bill Young Productions' own Sid Barbstein. He looks great, by the way. Lost a ton of weight, looking super healthy and fit. A happy birthday to everybody from the gang here at Promoter 101. You know, you got to wonder when you look at Sid, every time you see him post something on social media, it's him cooking brisket or making something amazingly delicious. And how he's losing the weight must mean he found a diet that includes eating brisket. I mean, that's a pretty good diet, Dan. I want to get on the all brisket diet. That is a diet out there somewhere in the world. Somebody from Austin, Texas, please email us. Well, let's hit up Sid and see if we can get him to do a diet section on the podcast about how to eat brisket and lose weight simultaneously. Because holy shit, he looks great. Good on you, Sid. And happy birthday. Call your mother. Call your mother. Hi, my name is Jay Williams from WME, and you're listening to Promoter 101. The quote of the week comes to us from Henry Ford. Don't find fault. Find the remedy. Clearly a Jason Mraz fan there, Luke. It's true. Mraz was very before his time. That'll do it. Episode 118 of Promoter 101 in the books. Thank you all for tuning into this podcast. And a very special thanks to all of our guests this week from First Avenue in Minneapolis, Nate Kranz from APA, AJ Paul, and UTA, Jeremy's Holgerson. Thank you all for coming on here. And if you're not already, take two seconds 
drop us a line. Let us know what you think of this. Drop us a review if you care to. And make sure you subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. You can hit us up at Steine at Promoter101.net. Next week, we'll be back with CEO of Tour Design, Deborah Ferguson. But you might know her as Fergie. Fergie Ferg, back in the pod. Looking forward to that. We're also going to be joined by the general manager of UC Theater, Matt Smitty-Smith, stopping by for a chat. Apparently, it's middle name, nickname kind of week on Promoter 101 next week. William Lucas Pierce, Matt Smitty-Smith, and Deborah Fergie Ferg. And we'll have to roll out the Daniel Cash Steinberg next week, apparently. And then we'll have a war story from City Wineries, Shlomo Lippitz. I wonder what his middle name is, Luke. Don't know. It's got to be something cool in Hebrew. I mean, if you're starting with Shlomo, it would be a letdown to be like Sheldon after that. It's got to be something awesome. We'll have to ask him next time he comes on the podcast. But an Israeli baseball player that is now running the city wineries booking for, well, most of the U.S. is pretty impressive. I can't wait to hear that story. But his war story and his interview are coming up in the weeks to come. That'll be great. And between now and then, we're wishing you all sold out shows for the weeks to come. Cheers. Call your mother. Call your mother. Text your father. Lucy Lawler Fries, Rival Entertainment and the Fox Theater in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm on Promoter 101. Ooh. Ba-da-ba-ba. Ba-da-ba-ba.